And the whole subject of antennas and efficiency and losses is filled with jargon and trying to cover the whole thing you think, well, maybe I could give a survey. That doesn't work. So what we're going to talk about tonight, we're going to start from the very bottom up. And all we're going to try and do is get the power to the load. And we don't care tonight whether it's this great amount of aluminum that you put up to get to A or just your dummy load. All we're going to talk about today will be the same for either one. So we have to we have to start by by understanding impedance. Impedance has two parts: resistance and reactance. Resistance, the voltage and the current are in phase. Power is dissipated. It can only have a positive value. Yeah. And people like me who done a lot of work in this area will always slip into calling it the real part. Don't worry why we call it the real part. But but you'll know I'm talking about this if I talk about the real part. And we have our two kinds of reactants. Two, only two. The inductor and the capacitor. And for both of these, the voltage and the current are 90 degrees apart. Therefore, power is stored. No power is dissipated at all. So tonight, all our capacitors are going to be perfect, and all our inductors are going to be perfect. Let me get this thing out of here. So, just to uh, show what we mean by a 90 degree phase shift, the, the one that reads peaks here, and when it gets down to zero, the waveform that's 90 degrees behind it peaks. And then when this one gets to zero, this guy's at its most negative. This gets to zero, this guy's the most negative. And then back. So we can we can use these L's and C's to produce resonance, and there'll be a good reason for it that we'll show you. A resonance occurs at two pi times the frequency, which we're going to call omega. Sorry, I didn't have a really good omega here, but uh, we'll call that omega, and that frequency and that is one over the square root of L C. And at this frequency, the two reactances are equal in magnitude, but they're opposite in sign. So if you put the resonant L and C in series, one cancels the other, and the sum of the two reactances is zero, and you get a short circuit. If you put them in parallel, that formula tells you what the net reactance is. And lo and behold, you're dividing by zero. So you get an open circuit. At, at any one frequency, any kind of a R, L, and C combination can be modeled in either of two ways. A, a reactance in series with a resistance or a reactance in parallel with a resistance. And these are not equal to each other. There's a transformation between one and the other. Now, there may be all kinds of stuff inside this network and it may go look completely different at some other frequency. But at any one frequency, you can bottle it down to a series reactance 
and resistance are parallel. So Ron, at those frequencies on the left, when you're in residence, that's just the short, and so you just yeah, wind well, up with whatever the resistive load that's is. That's the next slide. And I think. Okay. So ah. if you if one of the things you're gonna to need to do is get that power into a resistance. You can't put power into a reactance. So if you happen to have a load like this and you want the reactance to be canceled, notice I'm using the term cancel here. It's because it means something a little bit different over here than it does over here. So if we put a reactor of the exact opposite of this one, lo and behold, this part's a short circuit, and the impedance you get looking in is completely resistive, and it's equal to this RS that you started out with. You could also find, you, you take your parallel model, and you take the negative of that reactance, you put it in parallel, now these guys produce an open circuit. And the resistance you see looking in is the parallel resistance. But again, these, these are going to be two different values of resistance. And if you needed to get rid of, take a resistance, and and keep it a resistance and make it make it a different resistance. You do things like transformers and uh, auto transformers and stuff like that. So a transformer is like a ballon in the transmission. Yeah, yep, a ballon. You know there are one to one ballons and four to one ballons, and you can turn them around and they're one to four ballons, stuff like that. And there are other there are a lot of ways. Oops, wrong way. There are just all kinds of different ways, depending on what you're trying to do, how much frequency you're trying to do it over. There's L sections and ties and T's, and, and also there's a lot of art in using a transmission line itself as part of your matching network. By the way, for the newer hams, the diagram on the right side is very prominent in the technician uh, class uh, license. Um, uh, questions. So, so a whole talk could go on all of the different ways of matching. But since your since your uh, antenna is uh, somewhere back in the woods, so the neighbors won't complain, you're going to need a transmission line. And what a transmission line is is it's got an inductance per unit length and it's got a capacitance per unit length. So it's just a very large string of little inductances and little capacitance. And you could make it into extremely tiny ones because it's really a capacitance per unit length and inductance per unit length. They're all, they're all reactive so they can't dissipate any power. However, there's a delay through this, or a phase shift. That's two ways of describing the same thing. In most uh, transmission lines, there's a velocity factor. And that's just the factor of how fast the the, uh, the energy travels compared to the speed of light. So you're using materials in here that are uh, a little different uh, characteristic than the air or free space. So it's going to move slower. And that means here's another piece of jargon which sometimes gets thrown out and people uh, don't completely follow what it means. What it means is if you wanted a certain amount of phase shift and you calculated it, the length in an ordinary coax 
will be shorter. So if you want a 360 degree phase shift in the line, in air it'll be one thing, but in a normal coax, and a lot of the other kinds too, it'll be somewhat shorter, shorter length. And it has this property called a characteristic impedance. And we'll, we'll pass over mathematically what it means, but you'll, when you go to use a coax, they'll tell you what the number is. So we've got delay and phase shift. And I'm showing here one electrical wavelength. So if I if I'm putting the power in here, this the phase of this here is going to be 360 degrees behind the phase here. So if you looked at them, they'd both be peaking at the same time. But one guy's an entire cycle behind the stuff coming in. So, if you want the if, how do I say this now? <laughs> if we use a resistor, a load that happens to be equal to this T zero, we find we have a match and. And we can't have any reactants there. So what will happen is, over any length of line, the impedance is going to look like this IRL and have no reactants. You make a long, make it short, anywhere. It's always going to be the same impedance. And if you put a voltage in at one end, it's going to stay the same voltage. So that's why the the, uh, the ancient term a flat line came about because the voltage stays constant down the whole line. Now, if the load has some reactants and doesn't happen to be equal to the Z0 of the line, the R and the X that you see going in vary as you change the length of the line. And there will be a non-zero value for the reactants at almost every point along the line. But there, there's a couple of places that are very educational that that it uh, does happen to be resistive. So we can take our load with the reactants and start lengthening the line. Eventually, we're going to get to a place where the reactance goes away. It gets to zero. And the input resistance now looks quite a bit bigger than Z zero. And this is the this is the maximum resistance that you're going to get for any length. So if we If we start at that maximum resistance point, where x is zero, then we start adding some more coax. We can see what's going to happen now. We go on a quarter of a way from this maximum point, 
and we get a resistance that's this Z0 squared over that maximum resistance. And again, we've had another point where X is zero. So we have no reactants. Now, if we continue another quarter wave, we're back to the resistance being the maximum and no reactants. And here's our, here's our first definition of the SWR. R max over Z0, or Z0 over R min. So there's, there's no power being lost. This is still completely lost. But the voltage along the line is varying. The power along the line stays the same, but the voltage varies, and the impedance varies. And there's reactants. So if we put, we put our transmitter and our amplifier in and start watching what happens to the voltage and the power, um, and we and we and we if we know we put it in just the right amount for it to be at the maximum voltage. It, it's and we and we look at the voltage along here. It's going to go from the maximum to the minimum and back to the maximum. Quarter wave, another quarter wave, and then that just repeats itself. And there's our other definition of SWR. It's the ratio of that maximum voltage to the minimum voltage. So if you look along this line, okay. The voltage is going up and down, but the power is not. But, if you put this amplifier somewhere along here, you got a completely different situation than you do with a flat line. So this is the 2.1 SWR at 50 ohms. And here's the resistance and here's the reactance. So, where the voltage or where the resistance uh, is maximum, the reactance is zero. Where the resistance is minimum, the reactance is zero. And then it just keeps going. It repeats twice every wavelength. So, if you have a 2 to 1 SWR, your SWR meter is going to call it that SWR no matter how long the transmission line is. But, the impedance, the resistance, and the reactants are going quite a bit uh, all over the place. What else can I say? So the peak resistance here for a 2 to 1 SWR is a factor of 2, so that's 100 ohms. And the minimum is 50 divided by 2, and that's 25 ohms. So, if you just hook a 2 to 1 SWR into any length uh, transmission line, what your amplifier is going to see is very different. Right? This is 100 ohms to 25 ohms. So even though the SWR is what it is, the effect on your amplifier is going to be quite a bit different. So, now that we know that much about it, let's just uh, summarize here. Use the term SWR to describe the mismatch. 
no matter how long or short the line is, even if there's no transmission line at all. And it's not possible to predict the performance of the system, antenna, feed line, transmitter, just from knowing the SWR. So, we can look at some of the things you have to think about when you're starting to put all this stuff together to build yourself a station. One thing you have a feed line for is to put some distance between yourself and your RF. You may want to get your antenna up as high as possible. You may need to put it out in the far corner of the lot so you have enough room for your verticals. At, at my small house on a small lot, uh, keeping the RF out of everything in my house is part of my problem. <laughs> so putting as much distance as I can on my small lot matters because I can get RF into everything, telephones, uh, computers, and you know, I skipped this guy, you may need to keep it away from your uh, home wiring, your aluminum gutters, your siding, whatever things you have on your property that are going to uh, do things to your uh, transmitted signal. So you may need matching here, you may need matching there, and you're going to have to pick a transmission line. Now these solid state amplifiers, and this, this also applies to the transceiver, they're, they're very similar uh, uh, kinds of amplifiers, whether it's 100 watts or uh, uh, full legal. They're designed to operate in the 50 ohms. They're generally happy up to about 1.5. Many of them automatically shut down about the time you get to two. I suggest you read your manual. If you're contemplating an antenna feed line that's other than 50 ohms, you're going to need to do something. And uh, a popular one uh, is 450, and there are a bunch of things in between there and uh, 50 ohms. So you probably will want to do some matching right here at the, at the uh, amplifier so that what's happening here is matched to what's going on at the rest of the antenna. So a lot of perfectly good antennas aren't 50 ohms as well. So in a lot of cases, the guy who manufactures the antenna puts the matching right in. And some of the stuff that you build for yourself, you're going to have to work that part out. And uh, you can look in your handbook about how to do various kinds of matching at the antenna end. If you, if you do that, you can get the SWR down to something comfortable for a 50 ohm amplifier. And you may not need to do any kind of matching at the end. Well, all of that's nice, but Having something in the shack that you can adjust has a whole lot of stuff going for it. You can do tweaks for the effects of rain, wind, ice, what have you. And you can make all your adjustments in a place where the OM can stay warm and dry. So, 
you can do it, but you're not going to compensate for the mismatch between the bead line and the antenna. If this is very far from 50 and this is 50, your amplifier will be happy, but everywhere else along here will will have high SWR. And if you took your voltmeter out there, you'd see all that voltage variation. Doesn't mean it doesn't work. It does mean, and it doesn't mean your amplifier isn't very happy with what's going on. The, the higher that mismatch, go back and look at that just for a second. The higher the mismatch here, this, the greater the losses along the feed line. And whether that's going to bother you or not depends. Here's how the losses go as a function of the SWR. So RG58, you know, at uh, three and a half megahertz, 0 0.6, 10 megahertz jumps to 1.2. At 10 meters, it's up to 2.3. If, if you get out here to really the more outrageous end, the losses tend to pile up, and particularly at higher frequencies. If you're receiving with the same one as you're transmitting with, you might not want to have these losses in a receive band. Because that, that can mean an actual loss of signal noise ratio. So if you're building some new concoction for 160, none of this stuff isn't going to turn out to matter that much. But the higher you go and the longer you go and the cheaper you are about the cable you're willing to buy, you could go from not a real problem to, ooh, I don't think I want that to happen. So, Ron, those numbers are a little bit small from back here. Yeah. But let's say you have a three, and again, I can't see the SWRs, but let's say you have a three to one SWR at 28 megahertz. Yeah. With RG58. Yeah, 3.4 dB. So, in other words, you're losing over half your power. Right. Okay. And well, that's being dissipated as heat in the system. Mm -hmm. that and and again, if you're... Heat along the line. And of course, as you go up in frequency, all of the non-thermal noise gets lower and lower. If you, if you have on 80 meters, um, 10 dB of loss and receive, it doesn't matter. You'll turn up your gain control because that noise is going up and down just with the signal. And if you just need a little more power output, you can turn up the knob. Because the transmitter, the amplifier, is still happy. Only the stuff on the far side of that matching network is is incurring these losses. Okay, for the guy new to VHF now, now I'm really confused because for my entire 60 years of ham radio and HF, you're very worried about SWR. You're constantly dealing with tuners, balance, wire, all that stuff. So my whole life, just again. Every time I buy a VHF or UHF radio, there's not only no SWR metering on it, there's no tuner available. But why does it not seem to care when that argues that, in fact, it's more critical? Well, the mathematics doesn't change. The, the sizes of things right. change. The, the losses can be higher. So why would you buy a 9700 Icon for 2000 bucks? Does it have a tuner? Yeah, 
when a thousand dollars will buy a three thousand with more KHF, and that's a nice antenna to it. But why would that be? Well, I haven't seen the ninety-seven hundred yet, but from what I've heard, the there's actually a separate box that attaches to it, where you have IF up and IF down at lower frequencies. So if you're transmitting like at ten gigahertz up at the top, okay. You don't need waveguide to go up to your antenna. You basically have an IF, I don't know what IF they pick, but an IF, let's say, arbitrarily 150 megahertz IF between that final amplifier at the top and the transceiver at the bottom. This is what I understand the way the 9700 is designed. Well, the, 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 the transmitter's final amplifier up at the top. So it's only, it's only a low power. Oh, yeah, you're talking about that. I'm, no, that's not 9700, it's 905. Oh, uh, the 95, you're right, yeah, you're right. 9700 is the, sort of the high-end 2 meters, uh, 440, 12 Oh, and there's no automatic antenna tuner? There is no antenna tuner. No, it, it might be worth putting on this chart. If it does deep, you know, it has really more flash and you would get a deep, deep, deep tuner, it. what do you call it? It lowers its power out. But, but I've been just playing with it. I just bought it, I've just been playing with it. But I'm just shocked that you spend that much money for radio and there's no Push the two. You, you can program. think about this with two cases. For most people that do FM work, they're going to buy commercial antennas, you know, like you put on your car or maybe a ground plane that you set right. up on a mast. And those antennas are pre-tuned to be reasonably close to resonant or matched. So you don't worry about it there. The other thing you can see the answer to why tuners are not popular at BHF and above is right here on this chart. Look at what happens to the mismatch loss as you go up in frequency. Right. So you're much more effective by creating a good match with the antenna than trying to tune out a mismatch at and, and And the higher you go in frequency, the more receive becomes important. Right. Yeah. Because there's just so much other That's noise. The lower and lower you go in frequency, the more non-thermal noise there is. That's why the first thing a six meter guy does is he put the receive preamp at the Upon top the of the tower. Right. Yeah, I can, just a tip of I can get 3 dB by going from 100 watts to 200 watts and just turning up the knob. But you can't do that on receive. Yeah. You, you might want to add VHF and UHF frequencies to your table. There. That's, well, that's, I, really, I think, that's, that's really uh, where it, it, it would become obvious to somebody looking at it saying, well, I, well I VHF think, and UHF is really critical. That's why the connectors change too. The connectors change. Oh, oh absolutely. The cables, absolutely. Those the crosses get bigger. The residents of the antenna. But, but I think, I think in practical terms, what these guys are saying is, you're going to be out of luck if you don't get it matched and then hoist it up, right. <laughs> or bring it up and down several times till it's working right. And I think the VHF antennas are less susceptible to the kinds of things that we have in the low bands. I think they're also uh, more broadband as well. Uh, we have very narrow slices of VHF. Right. Right? As a percentage of the fundamentals, I think right. what you're yeah. saying, yeah. you're tuning less than you are at 3.5 megahertz, you can go all the way to 3.9, you're basically increasing by. So the VHF antennas and UHF antennas are much more of a... So they'll be flatter over a bigger... So you typically don't and have an SW... And they're, a, they're physically and small, and they don't yeah, tend to collect as much snow and ice. Right. I mean, to me, I was in the middle of the CQ Worldwide at my friend's place, and he'd actually thrown up a 40-meter dipole, so I'd have 40 meters for the contest full legal limit with his with his ACOM amplifier and the SWR started. And and it just been that first of December rain turning to ice on your antenna and the antenna began to sag and the SWR started to go out of sight. Yeah. And the ACOM switched off automatically. Well no, Will came down and saw what was going on and switched it off before the automatic shut off, got around to it. The other thing to consider when you look at the problem of where to match, when you match at many antennas, you're dealing with a relatively limited range of frequency and 
larger components that are efficient. You know, building a good ballon at 20 meters in a box that you know is yay big or smaller, right? you can build a pretty efficient device. The tuner in your radio has got to work over a wide range with small inductors and capacitors. And so while that tuner can do that over some range of frequencies, it's going to have a lot more loss inherent in the tuner. And so the other equation in this for, for big mismatches, like when you get in that four to one range and higher, is it's usually a lot more efficient to fix it at the antenna and have the feed line losses below and not have a big loss in the tuner in your radio than it is to try to <coughs> fall back to the radio and do with it there. That's right. I know in aviation HF radios, we've always put the tuner way out the tail where we attach the antenna. Right. Yep. And then you run it up to be balanced out there. Uh, yep. <clears throat> now, to his point, 80 to 160 meters, you know, it, it's hard to make it matter. But when you get up to, you know, 15 meters and higher in particular, it starts to matter. When you get up in the, the 400 megahertz and higher, it starts to matter a lot. And, of course, the lower you go, the harder it is to make whatever your matching network is work across the whole band. Yeah, that's right. Right? So... If you gotta run out and let down, let down the center of your antenna so you can uh, work the high end of the band, you're not gonna be happy. But if you happen to be warming up your transmission line and your amplifier is happy, you're not gonna want to go out in the wind and rain to to do those things. So it's 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 really a matter of what do you want to do? How far are you sending the signals? Uh, do you have any receive problems uh, that that you have to decide? But when your amplifier decides to shut itself off, it's going to shut itself off. You're going to back the power down. It's a matter of design parameters. What's your application? What do you design parameters that are tolerable? You design for that. In some cases, you're going to have two antennas. If you get too broad at the goal of frequency, then it makes sense to have two antennas. One portion of the band and one for the other. But if VHF and UHF, some people put VHF and UHF antennas up on 100 foot down. There's loss. You can put the match, as you said. There are losses because of the run, the frequency. And that's when the connectors become important, the feed line becomes important, as well as the design and the implementation of the antenna. Mm -hmm. Maxwell wrote a, a great book about this. Most people probably be familiar with his kind of touches. He was the guy that designed the communication systems for the space program back in the 50s and 60s. So he was truly interested in this topic, as would you read his education. The point you made about preamps for weak signal work on VHF foot above is also worth thinking about. There's two reasons that preamps, not so much on six meters because radio's noise factors and so on have gotten pretty good at that frequency, but when you get higher, you're finding two problems. Any signal that's lost in the feed line in the long run, which it tends to be at high frequencies, is lost signal to noise ratio that you cannot get back, right? So if you amplify those signals at, right at the antenna and maybe bring them up 10 or 15 dB, which is pretty easily to do with modern preamps, you now have overcome some pretty sizable loss numbers and still maintain your, your signal to noise ratio of the radio. The other big reason for doing that is modern preamps that are say based on gas fed transistors have very low what are called noise factors. They provide a lot of gain with very little noise add and oftentimes that preamp is better performing the front end of your radio. So even if you don't have a loss problem, unless you have a very high quality transverter, if you're, you know, if you're up at a gigahertz or higher, or you have a very good radio, putting that preamp there will just actually improve the sensitivity and the signal noise performance of the whole system feed line losses in mind. Sure. And in that scenario, you can start, especially if you have more power than you need, because power is a little bit less important than, say, a gigahertz, and it tipped because of the, the, what you said about the noise situation, then it would be, say, at 10 meters. You can get away with a better, a, a worse mismatch and more feed line losses. You overcome the front end with the power in, 
and you overcome the received loss with a preamp, and you live with the fact that maybe your SWR is 2 to 1. Yep. So there's lots of different factors to consider when you kind of design a system like this. So you read Maxwell's book? Well, I kind of did it for a living for a little while. Sure. Is the, uh, is the uh, two SWR cut off in the uh, transceiver, is that a function of the uh, um, protecting the output surface of the transistor? Yeah. yeah, the guys who design the amplifier decide. How many how many returns they want, and how many uh, angry calls they want to get, and they build it the way they want to build it, and they tell you whatever they tell you on the front panel. You know, back in the old days, too, if you worry about it, when you're checking the uh, the flats on the front, and you've got a variation on the frequency, they're going to cap it at two, even though it's not optimal for a certain frequency. Yeah, they can't have a lot well, I don't know. Going back, going back to 1957 when I started, everybody was so petrified about TVI. Yeah. Then they put started putting all the matching networks inside the metal can. Mm -hmm. So you had your tuner and your transmitter all in one metal box. So, and there were tube amplifiers, and they probably did not have this kind of pure voltage output like today's solid state amps do. But there was a Pi network in there and your antenna could be God knows what and the tube would be happy. Well, we Once you twiddled it. Like okay. a low pass filter on the ass end of the thing no matter what, right? Right. Remember the old days? Right. Yeah. But but now we have the luxury of digital <coughs> TV, and uh, we don't have to do that anymore. But the solid state amplifiers really are voltage. They will always try and put out whatever voltage you tell them to put out until it reaches the point where the guys who designed the fail circuit decides that's too much and that'll shut it down. Anything else? Any other questions? Thank you, Ron. Excellent. Just real quick, I want to thank Jim.